I'm excited today because my special guest is Jerry Jarrett. He lives near Nashville, Tennessee, and for many years he owned a promotion company that promoted professional wrestling events in many states, including Tennessee, Kentucky, Indiana, Missouri, Arkansas, Alabama, and Mississippi. They were collectively known as the Memphis Territory, and he's also been successful, though, in a lot of different businesses over the years, including the construction business, land development, and real estate rentals, and that's primarily primarily uh, some of the stuff I want to talk to him about and just life in general. I recently read his autobiography and it's called The Best of Times. I read it over about the last five or six days and I'm excited to have Jerry Jarrett on our show today. Jerry, welcome to our program. Tony, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate the kind words about my book and I'm looking forward to our little discussion today. You bet. One of the things that resonated with me, because I started off much the same way in the early 70s by mowing lawns and earning money, and I noticed that you did too. Your mom told you you had a good lawnmower, and that was a vehicle to make some money. So did you always want to be in business for yourself and be an entrepreneur? No, you know, honestly, I didn't. Back in those days, it was a push mower. And, and so cutting lawns was a really, really tough, you know, way to go. But I appreciated the uh, quarters and 50 cents that they paid me. And one thing that gave me a huge advantage as a kid, uh, and you'll find this strange, is that my father decided he didn't want to be married and he left the marriage when I was three years old. So my mother very early uh, was wise enough to say, because you know how kids are. Oh, sure. You go to the grocery store next door to it was a five and dime. And I, I wanted a pea shooter or a, or a slingshot or, you know, I was always wanting things. And so in her wisdom, she sat down with me and showed me her little checkbook and budgeting and, and said, you know, you have to live within your means. And if you don't, you wouldn't like it if we got up and didn't have a bowl of cereal for breakfast. So she taught me the value of money and budgeting when I was probably eight to 10 years old. So, you know, even though it was hard work, 50 cents from this yard, and I had eight or 10 yards on my street, suddenly I had a pocket full of money. Yeah. And I really liked that. That's awesome. I don't think you mentioned it in the book, but it just occurred to me while we were talking, did that lawnmower have a motor or was it a, a real? No, no, it was a push mower. Yeah, that was the first one I used too. Yeah, this was in the uh, early 50s. I was born in 42, so in 52 I was 10. So sometime between 1950 and 52 or 3. So it was just one that had blades on it. Yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you brought up your mom. Her name was Christine, and she was also in the wrestling business. She was a ticket taker at um, at some of the events. What are two or three things you remember about her? You mentioned that the value of a dollar was one thing, but what was another thing or two that really influenced you so much? Well, uh, my mother was an absolute straight shooter. She uh, She would tell you like it is. After my experience growing up, I, I found out that a lot of people treat children um, without intellectual respect. And my mother never made that mistake. So <laughs> I'm laughing because sometimes I think my daughter doesn't appreciate it, but my grandson, Jared, from the time he was seven or eight years old, he and I would go out and sit on the porch and I would talk to him like an adult. And two or three times, he's 16 now, and a couple of times he's come and said, do you mind telling my mom and dad 
that I'm not uh, slow or <laughs> <laughs> that I understand things. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, not on your life. I'm not going to interfere. You, you need to uh, earn your stripes, son. But I would talk to him uh, as an adult. And I think this is good for kids that, you know, the sooner you face the realities of life, I think the better you can handle them. That's awesome, especially in uh, today's day and age where we've got so many distractions. When we were growing up, we didn't have as many distractions. We didn't have screens. We had television, but there were only two or three channels, and we didn't have as many distractions as kids today. So I think that's a pretty good Pretty good point you're making. Yeah. Now, at one point in your career, you worked in a position at a bicycle manufacturer, I think. How did you like working in an office and somebody else being your boss? Well, you know, I really loved the first four years that I was at Murray. I was fortunate that I had a great boss. His name was Walter Bannis. And Walter kind of took me under his wing and showed me the ropes and would coach me politically because every office is a micro political field whether you want to you know recognize it or not right the politics in an office are i mean you know it's just a part of life so Walter helped me to navigate those waters, uh, and I and I loved working for him. I was uh, I, I went to work at Murray as a purchasing clerk, and that's really a nice name for a filing clerk. <laughs> you know, one day C. W. Hannon, who I loved also, he was the founder and chairman of the company, he decided to retire and turn the business over to Bill Hannon. And Bill, and I, I'm not going to pass judgment on his goal, whether it was right or wrong, but he wanted to have his crew that he had appointed and not the crew that his father had appointed. And so he went to making changes and he called me in and said, uh, Jerry, I appreciate your contributions to this company. And I want you to be my vice president of purchasing. And I said, well, that's great, but I'm surprised that Walter didn't tell me he's retiring. Bill said, no, he's not. We're just, I'm going to make the change because I think it's healthier for me to have my crew instead of my father's crew in the top management of this company. So I, I watched the humiliation of Walter and several other men that I really admired and respected and decided that I didn't, I wasn't very good corporate man. So I went in and, and gave him my notice and said, you know, I'll stay here until you find a replacement if you make a legitimate effort to find a replacement. Your son will take over when I'm about Walter's age and I don't want to be here when he gets his own crew. So I left and... Uh, well, I never had the opportunity to go back. So I don't, I mean, to any corporation. So I'm not sure if I would have uh, been good in that arena because fate pushed me here and God pushed me there. And between these different moves, I ended up spending my whole life working for myself. 
So some of the things that were going on and just how you saw the company was functioning and and just some of the structural things, I mean, you you probably took away some lessons from that experience that helped you later. Oh, absolutely. Um, you know, I alluded to the politics of a company. And back in those days, I'm not sure where it came from, but I got a little, um, they would send me a little book every week that had Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and, and one day on it was this little poem, and it stuck with me my entire life. And it says, he drew a circle that shut me out, heretic, rebel, a thing to flout. Ah, but love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. And it was little stick figures. And, you know, at the top of the page was the circle that shut me out. And then the me drew a circle that took him in. And I remembered that at Murray, Bill Hannon drew a circle that shut a lot of people out. And I, in my businesses, I thought it best to draw a circle that took everybody in. And of all the politics that I've been involved in all my life, the ones that are the most affecting of your life is the politics in the workplace. So this has served me well. And as an example, Tony, when I was in the wrestling business, if there's a pecking order, you've got the superstars, the ones that are in the main events that draw the money. And then under that, you've got your semifinal guys. And then under that, you've got your, the negative term for it is curtain jerkers, but it's your opening matches. And then you have your en enhancement talent, and they're the ones that the stars beat up on TV. And then under that, you've got your referees. And at the very bottom of the pecking order is the ring man that carries the ring and sets it up. And so in my management thinking, he drew a circle that took me in. Oh, but Love and I had the wit to win. We drew a circle that took him in. I would often ride to the town with the ring guy because if you'll think about a wrestling match, if the ring doesn't get there, you don't have an event. It's pretty critical. Yes. Yeah, so, you know, in all of my companies, in the construction company, the guys that were in the bottom of a 20 foot ditch laying the water pipe, they're the ones that I would go to lunch with. And you see what happens is everybody in the company watches this and they see the politics of it. And they say, you know, Jerry's not high and mighty and he don't think he's better than us. And it wasn't that I was doing it for a show. I realized that the guy that carried the ring, the uh, guy in the bottom of the ditch leveling the gravel to lay the water pipe on, they may be the least paid employees in the organization, but they're probably the most important because if that gravel isn't level, that laser light will not show straight in the middle of the pipe. It'll be a little high or a little low. So if I have one thing to pass on to my grandson, it's to understand that it, that it takes 
everybody to to be successful. It takes everybody in the company. So the job that is so-called at the bottom of the pecking order oftentimes is the most important. In my work with CEOs, I constantly stress that. And the way I usually stress it is that you've got to make sure that everybody in the company knows their role and how their role plays a part in the whole business. And as you're talking, I'm sitting and thinking about a bank. A bank has a teller that sits at the window of the drive through Well, to the people that go through the drive through that teller is the bank. That's right. And so you have to make sure that everybody understands that their role is critical to the success. And I think, too, you even added more to it by you and your position. You added importance and attention and fellowship time with those people. I mean, that was probably highly valued by them. Yeah, I went to WWE for a while when Vince McMahon, the... uh, owner and founder and president, all that stuff, thought he was in trouble. Well, he was in trouble with the government. And he asked me to come up and uh, familiarize myself with his business in the event it went south. Thankfully, it didn't, and I was able to come back to my beloved south. You bet. (laughs) Anyway... They had a cafeteria there in Titan Towers. And the executives had a little section of the dining room. And then everybody else had another one. There were about 250, 280 people that worked in Titan Towers. And uh, I told Vince, I said, you know, I think having this executive section is not good. I think it, you know, if you've ever sat at the bottom, and that's where it was a blessing that I went to work at Murray as a purchasing clerk because I was at the bottom of the pecking order. And so I think it's important not to demean the people at the bottom and having a executive part of a dining room says so much about the company beyond where somebody eats their hamburger. You know, I've got uh, one company where I, I coach the CEO and they're a very large propane dealer in the United States. So they're located in six or seven states. My client visited one of the locations that was on the outer part of the company. And one of his employees said, you know, I've worked here for 40 some odd years and I think you're the first CEO I've ever actually seen. So that happens. Oh yeah. And ultimately it will manifest itself in, in the company going down or losing share of their market. If you don't preach every day that we are a community and this company is a microcosm of, of the cities we live in, the whole world, I just think that that is so, so important that you make everybody feel that they are an important spoke. You know, we were in the bicycle industry and you don't think about it when you're a kid riding a bike, but if one or two of those spokes get loose, the wheel will vibrate. And so every spoke in a bicycle wheel is important and every spoke in a company is important. You know, um, when you worked at Murray, you were married before to a different person than you are now. And when you left the company, I was reading in your book how you you went home and you told your wife, I quit my job today, but I've decided I'm going to, 
you know, earn some money on my own and go back into business for myself. And you weren't met with a lot of enthusiasm over that. But now you've remarried several years ago and your wife's name now is Deborah. And I'm going to give you a chance to brag on Deborah here a little bit because she was really integral in many parts of the book. And I just want to give you an opportunity to talk about what sort of things would Deborah do or say that's helped you be a success? Well, I mean, you know, we, we don't have enough time on your show <laughs> to enumerate all of them. Deborah and I have been married 46 years now. And the difference is, is that Deborah has been a great cheerleader for everything I've ever done. My first wife said, you know, the wrestling business is, uh, is beneath me. I don't want to have any part of it. Deborah would say, I'm so proud that that you're able to get in the ring in front of all those people and referee the match. And Deborah, they're going to let me wrestle tonight in Haytai, Missouri. Oh, that's great. And I'm sure you'll be terrific. She was a supporter all along in everything. And then they are the little things. I got a call from a guy named uh, uh, Von Eric, and he called and said, my business is in trouble. Me and my brother's going to close the door. I uh, just wanted to see if you might want to have any interest in coming out and picking up the pieces and taking over. Any deal you want, I'll do. And so I said, well, let me, let me think about it, Kerry. His name is Kerry Von Eric. So I hung up the phone and Deborah said, what was that about? And I said, oh, they're wanting me to go to Texas and, uh, look at the wrestling business out there and maybe take it over, but I'm just not interested. That's too far. My grandfather, who was the male in my life had always told me, Jerry, as you go down the creek, turn over every rock, big and small. Now in this exercise, son, you're going to, you're going to turn over rocks, got a snake under it, but you might turn over a rock that's got a gold nugget. So turn over every rock. <laughs> so when I hung up the phone from Carrie and Deborah said, what is that about? And I told her, she said, well, you might ought to go turn over that rock. There might just be a gold nugget under it. And so this kind of encouragement uh, to me was critical because, you know, your wife is your your only real partner in life. Yes. And uh, she always was there. She's a terrific cook, which me being fat is testimony of that. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, you know, I'm sure that I would not have had the success. I owe it to my mother and uh, because my mother would tell me every day, and I think this is important. It's not relating to your business, but I think it's an important life lesson. I've seen women scream at their kids and say, you idiot, I've told you not to do that. Uh, never one time did my mother ever say anything negative about me. On the other hand, she would tell me every two or three times a week, Jerry, God has blessed you with a strong back and a brilliant mind. You can do anything you set your mind to. And you know, she told me that so much, Tony, that I got to where I believed it. You started believing it. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 
Deborah came along and reinforced that. When I told her about the wrestling business, I said, you know, I after my experience in New York, uh, the reality that the territories are really not going to survive because of cable TV exposing the fact that there's a champion in every part of the country, in every business. And so that ability to suspend this belief is, is going to die. And Deborah picked right up where my mother had left off. And she said, well, I'm not worried at all. You will find something else to do and I'm sure you'll do it well. And that's, that's really important that every executive have a positive influence in their life. This macho thing that men have, we can't tell that, man, I'm scared. I don't know what the future holds. And, you know, we need somebody to comfort us, to kind of mother us. You know, I'm not at all ashamed to say that when I'm down, when I need some encouragement, I look to Deborah to prop me up. Well, I hope you're enjoying this interview with Jerry Jarrett as much as I am. He's sharing 70-something years worth of business knowledge and experience with us. And uh, his book is called The Best of Times. And we will conclude this interview on next week's podcast. Are you working twice as hard but enjoying fewer rewards? Maybe you're highly accomplished, but you just can't seem to break through and make the next big move. Or you run a business that has begun to grow stagnant. It doesn't have to stay that way. Even the best leaders have felt as if their careers were spiraling out of control, but that's when they had to lead and lead big. Tony Richards' new book, The Big Idea, 52 Ways to Be a Better Leader Now, will help launch you forward in leadership. Learn how to take charge and lead yourself, lead others, and lead your company. Purchase online today at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and our website, clearvisiondevelopment.com.